Jesus. Okay? <laughs> Solomon and David, two of the erstwhile kings of the Bible, okay? There is pretty substantial evidence that neither of these people ever lived. There never was a King David. There never was a, a King Solomon. For instance, you can actually find documented proof of the existence of King Sargon of Babylon, but you can find none on the existence of King David or King Solomon. But to me, that's exciting news. I, I'm not interested in people who fluffed around and did that. I'm interested in spirituality. If I pick up a Bible or whatever document it may be, and so what I pick up and what you should try to pick up is when you understand these two kings, they are two parts of your personality, okay? You have one, David, who is surrounded by war on all sides. And for the fact that he's surrounded by war on all sides, he cannot build the temple. And you have the other one, Solomon, whose name means peace, and he indeed builds the temple. So right away, you have an understanding that what this represents is the mind, each of us, the mind where the wars rage, the temple will never be constructed within, but where there is peace, then the temple can be, can be built. Solomon built God's temple, according to the Bible, which is part of this allegory. But Solomon is a part of us that's very interesting, because what happened is, after he built the temple, as many of us do in our meditation, he became distracted by other things. He became distracted through himself, through the things around him, through the physical things around him, and he turned away from the temple, see? Because and we, we all desire to have things, and that's fine, and I do too. But when we depend on our lower self instead of our higher self, then we are Solomon, and suddenly, even though we built the temple, we're too busy for the temple. We don't have, we know where the temple is, we know how to get to the temple, but we're too busy to go there because we have so many other things to do. And you, you would be surprised. I could show you, even in this place here, where on Tuesday nights, you know, we used to have people stacked up in the corners and laying all over the place. They couldn't wait to get to the temple. And though they found the temple, then after, they became too busy for it. it you know, they have too many other things to do. Just come on television or whatever. But the point that I'm trying to make here is something happened to Solomon in this parable or this allegory. Something came between him and God. Something came between him and the divine mind in the same way that things come between me and meditation or things come between you and meditation. Something happened. And the Bible has an extremely clever and beautiful way of identifying it. If you look with me, I think you'll find it very interesting. Go to page 303 in the little Bibles that you have. And it's interesting if you could open it up and just take a look at it and see what it says, all right? Page 303, and uh, it is 1 Kings, uh, and it's chapter 10. Now, remember what, what I'm saying here, and that this is why it's important for you to see for yourself. The Bible is not a history book. The Bible is not a book of drama. It's not, a, it's not written by a Tennessee Williams or, a, or, or, or you can think of some of the famous authors that you might have read about. It's something special. It's not something to be recited in churches. It's deeply mystical. And it tells you in no uncertain terms what goes on if you're only wise enough and have the eyes to open up and look. What got between Solomon and his ability to work with the temple, and the same thing that gets between us. Page 303, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, watch me, three score, three score is three times 20, which is 60, and six. What was it? Six, six, six. Do you see that? Do you see that? There is the identity, and if you'll add this out, as you know how to do, 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18, 1 plus 8 equals 9, which is consciousness, his mind. The mind, the gold of the lower mind became so obsessive that he neglected the temple. Just look at it again. It's in the book. It's in the book. The weight of gold that came to Solomon was 600, three score and six. Now, there's a very interesting thing in this Bible. 
if you look at the bottom of the page of my Bible, you know what it says? $127,872,000. They missed the whole thing. <laughs> they, they took it and they analyzed it out to how much money it was, and they totally missed 666. The lower mind is what took Solomon away from the temple. Okay. But I want you to see it. Don't you miss it. Okay. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14. The weight of gold was 600. Three score, a score is 20. Three score is three times 20, which is 60. 600, three score, and six. Six, six, six. Solomon and six, six, six. And of course, he was surrounded with all of this kind of... Now, where else did you ever hear of that? Whoever told you that? You're coming here, you're sitting here, and everybody else is gone home, and, and they've gone to church, and they heard nothing. You came, and on a Sunday night, in this remote place, in the basement of Vito's, whatever it is, you heard this amazing, and you all gasped because you'd never seen it before. Because this book is written by a divine cosmic intelligence. This book is written by a UFO, an unidentified floating object in the, in the areas of space that is totally to it. Hey, how could, this, how could it know about the pineal gland of the brain? How could it know that the speed of light is 186,400 miles per second? That's all in the Bible. And now it told you in that mystical code, because you have eyes to see, that what comes between you and the temple is 666, your mind. Okay? So, let's, let, let's take a look at it. First Kings, page 303. Uh, and we'll see something interesting. First Kings, chapter 10. Let's look at verse 23. Okay? King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Now, all of the earth, which is the lower mind, okay, looks to the position, sought Solomon to hear his wisdom, which is put into his heart. See? This is what happens when you go into meditation. This is what happens when you overcome the 666. You come into that place of understanding. You come into that. Look at what you know, for God's sake. Even for, though you, you sit, and I, it has been given to me the job to do this. Okay, maybe you don't. Pick it up maybe like I do. That's, that's neither here nor there. I don't pick up other things like you do. But the point is, look what you know and what you understand. Look at what you can see as soon as you see that 666. Bang, you know it. But the guy that wrote this book's got $127,827,000. He totally missed it. Totally missed it. So Solomon exceeded all the kings. All of this was coming. He stood for one whose physical wealth was looked upon as a sign of his wisdom and godliness, you see. And so they looked up to Solomon. But what was his downfall? And this is interesting. Now, those of you who know about the female and, and the lower aspect of mysticism and, and it, it standing for the emotions, look at the very next thing. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 11 on the next page, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Now, the strange woman is, is, is a mystical symbol. Strange woman. The woman is the lower emotion. You know, the emotions and the lower aspect. And a woman can also be the divine spirit. But we're talking about in the lower aspect, it means the emotions. And that is the emotions. That which feeds the emotions on the lower and causes you all of the assetment is called the strange woman. That's why they go against whoredoms and, and, and all of this kind of stuff and running around in the bridegroom because you're having intercourse. You're intercoursing with the strange woman when you take from the lower mind. When you are taking from the lower mind, you're intercoursing with the strange woman instead of taking from the bridegroom who dwells in the higher chamber, all right? Now, l let me show you something very interesting. Here it says that King Solomon loved many strange women, okay? Uh, you, know, th you know what I get a kick out of? Even, even the religious people, the born-again people, I mean, they freak out if some guy, if somebody has an affair or something, or something you know, it's all this, but this is the guy that built the temple. It's the guy that wrote half the Bible. I mean, he makes Jimmy Swaggart look like a, a, a celibate, you know? You know, it's such a joke. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? Go to page 542 and take a look, if you would, at the book of Proverbs. And let me, let me show you something. And if you'll look at Proverbs chapter 2, page 542, to be delivered out of the, out of the grasp of, of, of the mental problems and the things that cause us so much difficulty, you look at Proverbs chapter 2, 
and go to verse 16. <clears throat> to deliver you from the strange woman. Do you see that? To deliver you from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flatters with her words. In other words, that's the thoughts that come out of the mind. And so what we're saying here, that we understand something. The Bible's already told us through 666 that this is a question of consciousness. And that Solomon had wisdom because he knew he, he received from the higher realms of the mind. Forget there was any such man like this. It's not talking about a man. It's talking about you. You have wisdom. You have enlightenment. You have understanding. But there's a problem here. And if you start taking direction from the strange woman, if you start intercoursing for the direction of your life from the lower mind, there's going to be trouble. It has nothing to do with a man named Solomon. It has to do with you and me. This is a psychology course that you're taking right now. It's a psychology course, and it's given by the supreme cosmic teacher of the ages. And it has, he uses the names of Solomon and David to set up an allegorical way that you can, you can think of a story. But forget these people. It had nothing to do with it. They didn't even exist. It's talking about you who come into that realm of meditation. You begin to understand the ways of peace. But now you turn to the strange woman, which means the emotions of the lower mind. Now, what it says, look at 1 Kings on page, um, five, uh, what, what page am I, 303, and let's go to verse, chapter 11, verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, okay? Neither shall they come unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And all that's talking about is the lower mind. All that's talking about it, all the strange thoughts that come into your mind, all the strange, when you give heed to them, but it said, Solomon, clave unto these in love. See? In other words, what's, what's being said here is no matter how much I can speak to you, no matter how much I can speak to myself, I find the same thing. In, in, in the mystical terms of the mind, there's always the strange woman. In, in, in the terms of knowing that you should, you should spend that time in meditation, you should drop whatever you're doing, no matter when you're going to take up some kind of a course of action and go into meditation, there's a tendency to cleave onto those things which are physical to us. Because it's, it's too difficult otherwise for us to sit and say, oh, well, you know, I'll just give up everything and I'll just float off into nirvana and everything will come out right, see? But that's what's the problem, because when we cleave unto these types of things, we're cleaving unto the thoughts which come from the lower mind, and which causes trouble. Solomon clave unto the... Do you see? In other words, the lower self, the lower emotions, was what Solomon fell for. He who had built the temple left the temple. But it's not talking about him, it's talking about you and me. You know better. We all know better. We, we, turned, we had, we had a, um, a group of people in here for a dedication this afternoon. The fellow had seven kids and, and, and you know, all over the place. And, and he was talking that this was the first child that they ever had christened or dedicated outside of a mainline denominational church. And his family's freaking out. But he says they couldn't take it anymore. They couldn't continue with it. They wanted something for this child. They wanted a direction for this child. They had to get away from the Catholic and the Protestant fear and guilt and hell and devils and demons that has corrupted the kids all over the world. For God's sakes, if the kids aren't committing suicide, they're taking drugs. If they're not taking drugs, they're having babies. If they're not having babies, they're having abortions. If they're not having abortions, they're... God knows what. I mean, it's, they have taken the, the, the youth of this nation and the youth of this world and totally destroyed them. And they stand with their robes and their, and their gospel songs and invite people in. And still mothers drag the kids in by the, to go in and learn about the devil. Go in and learn about the God that's going to set fire to them. And all this crap instead of understanding the peace and the love and the beauty that dwells within each one of us. Instead of taking a child into a Sunday school and saying, look, you can do what Jesus did. You can do better than Jesus because Jesus said you could. They don't have the guts to say that because they know doggone well when you start raising kids up to follow in the steps of Jesus to do better, then they're not going to take, be able to control them with all of their wealth and all of their fear and all of their guilt. Well, anyhow. Now let's take a look at the question. We know about the seven chakras that rise up the spine that form the kundalini that form the book of life according to the Bible in Revelation 5.1. But of course, before they are opened, they are sealed and they become problems for us because each one of those things become a source of energy that is negative until they are addressed through meditation. And look at it says in, in chapter 11, 
of 1 Kings of Solomon, chapter 11, verse 3. And he had 700 wives. Do you honestly think? Come on. You know. Yeah, yeah, we're coming home tonight. Where's Lorraine? Uh, <laughs> yeah, 699, and she's here. Where the heck is she? <laughs> you say, yeah. He had 700 wives, which is the seven chakras, the seven nerve centers. Now, interestingly enough, as you'll see, and you can look at it in every book you want, you can look at it in the book of Job, you can look at it in, in, in Noah, there's always a seven combined with a three. In this particular case, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines because of the fact that that number 10 means completeness, and it's just a way of allegorically telling you that his schneid was just about complete. He was going under. Uh -huh. He was going under. Now look at 11.4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of, his, of David his father. Isn't that interesting? His father was on the roof of his house spying on a lady taking a bath. He had sex with her, made her pregnant, committed adultery, and then in order to get out of it, he tried to con her husband into coming home and sleeping with her. And her husband says, I can't, I have to stay with my soldiers. So David figured, well, okay, we'll take care of this another way. He put him in the front lines, and the guy got his head blown off. And this is the guy that was perfect in the sight of God. And you worry about your sins. And these, these are survival heroes, these guys. <laughs> I mean, this is stuff telling you the truth. These are the stories there. These are your heroes. See? Oh, son of David, the guy was, uh, was an adulterer and a murderer. He was perfect in the sight of God. This guy didn't make it. This guy, only had, this guy had 700 wives, a little too much, you know. 500, all right, but 700, you've gone too far. But he did evil in the sight. Look what it says, and Solomon did evil, verse 6, in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Okay? And basically, the key line there is, went not fully after the Lord. You go fully after the Lord when you meditate. When you're into meditation, and you're giving your time to listening to that which is coming from the right side, then you're going fully after the Lord. Okay? Now, here's the intro. Here we go. This, this is really good stuff. Do you, do you understand that you're not taking this as two guys, but you're taking this as yourself, and you're taking this, the identity of these people, as parts of your mind? Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, page 300, whatever it is, verse 7. Now watch this. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shamash. Okay? A high place for Shamash. The word Shamash means the destroyer. The destroyer. That's what the word chamash means. And what did he do? He built a high place for chamash. Notice the high place. This means the mind of Solomon, our minds, become consumed by the outside desires that will eventually destroy us. And they will. They'll destroy the family. They'll destroy the health. They'll destroy. And it doesn't make any difference. And you don't do it intentionally. You don't do anything to try to destroy anything. It just happens that if you're not on guard and you give that which is the authority within you over to the lower, you bring your emotions into this. It overrides that which is the divine aspect of the meditation. Shamash starts to rule in your life, which is the destroyer. And it will destroy your life. It doesn't make any difference what you do. Unless you leave it, come down from the mountain of Chamash back into the temple of the God who dwells at the right side. There's no way. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care whether you're Protestant, Catholic, what religion you belong to. This is Solomon you're talking about. You're talking about going to church and deciding which church you go to. You're talking about the guy that's put in the Bible as King Solomon, the man of wisdom, the one who wrote all of the books and, and the Psalms and all of this stuff. And he was taken over by Shamash, which is the destroyer, because he let his guard down. Because he let us go. And this is what the book is talking to you about. I wonder what, what it says here. Solomon built a high place for Shamash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech. Molech is the one who destroys children. That's what that means. 
that you threw him in the fire of Moloch, the destroyer of children, the destroyer of the things that are born out of your mind, the new, the new things that come out of your mind. Look what has happened. Listen what, look, listen what we've got so far. You come into meditation, you understand your meditation, you find the temple because you have come in and you found the peace. Whether it be with Vangelis, whether it be with Kitaro, whether it be Om, whether you've got a book, whatever it was, some way you found that temple and you built that temple in the peace of the divine mind. And after the temple was built, you started to turn and you started to open yourself to those things which came from the emotional nature. And before you know it, there was an altar built within you to Jamash because you were set up to be destroyed. You weren't paying any attention to it anymore. It wasn't that important to you anymore. And the Bible in this book is simply saying to you, once that moves in, you gotta, you're going to be destroyed. And what it means here, that our minds become consumed by these outside desires, and they are the things that destroy. Because each one of us has tasted the good wine of meditation. We have seen things change, and, and so many, and there's so many that are not here, but, but those of, who have come through this door have seen their lives change positively. I was talking to somebody today that's having so many problems. Even though she comes here, meditates, having so many problems. But you know, as I stood and listened for a few moments, you know what's at the root of the problems? What her family thinks. Her family thinks she's joined a cult because she comes here. This is, this is devastating her. Even though she knows this is right, even though she knows that it's true, she's bombarded because she stepped away from, the, from all of that stuff which tradition follows. And so Chamash is starting to erect an altar with inside of her which is being built by her family. Because she's listening to it, and she's open to it, as opposed to the people who brought their child in here to be dedicated. None of the family came. The mothers didn't come. The uncles didn't come. The aunts didn't come because they stepped outside. But the people came anyhow. They took a step anyhow. They brought the child in here. Nobody came to see this but the godmother and the godfather and their seven children. That was good enough for them. They couldn't take it anymore with the religion and the guilt and the fear and the destruction of young lives that it rages all over the world. They stepped outside of it. And uh, so basically that's what this is all about. Things happened that were positive, but we started looking at the things, and, and, and we started looking at the things on the outside, and the things at the outside became more important than the things of the inside. The things that destroy became much more important than the things that heal. Because after the good things come through meditation, and we turn away to the lower things, then the trouble soon comes. But it's hard for us to admit it then. Did you ever notice that? Once a person turns on to it, then they leave it. It's very, very hard to come back. Because they'll never admit, never ever admit, that it was turning away from the meditation that caused the problem. Never admit it. Say, oh, it's something else, or something I did, or something. It never admit that I was plugged into this and, and things were starting to turn in the right direction, and I came a cropper because of all of the, of, the, of the conflicts of the mind, and so something happened. They'll never admit it. But now watch what happens here. First Kings chapter 11, let's go to verse 11. And look what it says. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done by you, you haven't kept my covenant, my statutes, with I will surely rend the kingdom from you, and I will give it to your servant. The one, the thing that is inside of you that you're supposed to be controlling is going to have control of you. That thing that you're supposed to have dominion over, the animal nature within you is going to have dominion over you. Not because there's any God that's making it that way, but because we have turned. We have built the temple, now we left the temple. And that's what the story's about. Now look at here's something interesting. This is really interesting. 11.14, 1 Kings 11, chapter 14. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad. Hadad is the name of a Syrian god. A name of a Syrian god. The adversary is our own mind. The thoughts become the adversary. And with the adversary comes fear. Strange things, say, start to come within us, and we're starting to deal with these things, all because of the fact that we have vacated the temple. And it, what it, what's being said to you is if you find that holy temple in meditation, 
Things will start to harmonize with nature. Things will start to plug the right way. But as you leave it, and as you start to abandon that temple, things are going to start to go wrong. And you're being told this. You're being told. And, and what does it require? It doesn't require any money. You don't have to spend any money. You don't have to say any prayers. You don't have to join any church. You don't have to get involved in any cult or any club. You just have to keep that temple with inside of yourself. Visit that temple. Make your way into that temple and let it provide you the wisdom and understanding. Well, how, how does this happen to you? What's happening? What's being said here? Do you lose your job? Do you lose your money? Do you, what happens? I want to introduce you to a strange name that you're going to uh, encounter now as we, as we talk about this. It's J-E-R-O-B-O-A-M. Jeroboam, or something like that. It means the increase of the people. The increase of the flesh. Okay, the power of the flesh. This is the one who's going to take away from Solomon all that Solomon had. And this is the one who history says is the man who made Israel sin. Okay. So this is, in other words, forget about Israel. Forget about Jeroboam. Forget about uh, Solomon. Forget about... Understand that what's being said here is that when you let go of this temple life within you through meditation, everything within you will start to drift into the hands of that which is represented by Jeroboam, the one who made Israel sin, that which is the power of the flesh, that which is the power of the lower mind. And look what it says in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 31, talking to Joabon, okay? It says, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have, in verse 32, it says, He shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. In other words, there is always that flicker of light in the temple. There is all that you've got left not because there's any God who took it away. Not because there's any curse. Every, see, every, what happened here? Everything that Solomon did, he did. No God did it. No, everything he did. He knew he did what he wanted to do, and the whole thing came tumbling down. The whole thing came apart. Things started to slip away. It was better before, but we have no inkling that we're losing and that things are starting to go bad because we've turned away from that which is the true temple within us. And that's what's happening here. In this story, the kingdom of Solomon is given in parcels to Jeroboam. But Solomon was over the edge now, see. He had had everything. He never realized that this prosperity that had come his way was not from him. Because it was because he had, he had built the temple. But when he closed his mind on that temple, the problem is we, we prosper so much in our lives through meditation, but when we start to lose it, we never realize that it was meditation from whence came these blessings in the first place. We become so busy that we, we broke away from the very meditation that was the source of, of our improvement, and that's what this story is about. Now we start feeling blue. Things start going bad. But we're still trying to steer our own course. We're still trying to work things out. We can never acknowledge that there's any kind of a thing that possibly we might have made a mistake. Possibly we might have been wrong. If anything, we begin to get angry about it. We begin to fight. We begin to be totally self-centered. And what do we do? It says in 1 Kings 11, chapter 40, And Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. But you can't kill the lower mind. You can't kill that which is the lower mind. It won't die. It'll never die. Look what it says. Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt and was there until the death of Solomon. Because of the wars that were surrounding you, you can't in any way, shape, or form kill out that which is the lower mind. It won't die. And Solomon couldn't. But the peace that he had turned to war. The peace that he had turned to war because we left the meditation to take control of our own course. And it says in, in 1 Kings 11, chapter 11, verse 42, 
And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And the four stands for the physical fourfold nature. And so the story comes to a conclusion. But the point that I, I would make as we've gone through this story is that dwelling within ourselves, giving our minds over to the glory and the beauty of divine meditation gave us good things. And how close have we stayed? Or, or have we drifted away? Because, you know, time doesn't allow you for meditation. There's more important things to do. But it says here in the story that we've just covered with Solomon that we will lose what we've gained little by little by little. And as we do, we begin to function in the fear. And fully there will be war that rages with inside of us. And it all happens in your home. It all happens in your family. It happens in your body. It happens to you. And basically, that's the story of Solomon in 666. Yes, sir? Jeroboam. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, nobody can hear me. <coughs> Jeroboam. I caught this real late, but that's the devil, right? That he, he he's representative, uh, uh, a representation of the devil. I mean, the little spot, uh, foxes spoil the vine, right? The little things that you do, you consistently do them. You you break your uh, meditation, your your peace of mind. Slowly it ebbs away. You give in to your physical needs, so on and so forth. The devil takes over and evil, you know. That's exactly right. And, and basically what he said is, 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 you know, he might have only heard a little bit of it, but I couldn't have summed it up any better. That's exactly what the story saying. That as, and, and, and the, point, the point being that once you had everything, remember in this story Solomon, which represents the higher consciousness, had it all. But he started intercoursing with the strange women. In other words, the Bible says, as you start directing yourself to that lower aspect of the mind, then everything is taken away. Because you can't have that which is the temple and be doing that, experimenting with the lower mind, and then allow... So all of a sudden, Jeroboam, which be, actually, exactly what he said, that which represents the lower part, which is going to destroy and going to suck away little by little everything that you had, starts to take over. And even then, when in his anger and his violence, Solomon tried to rage against this, it was too late. Nothing could be done. And where does Jeroboam go back to Egypt, which is the seat of the lower mind? Egypt always represents the lower mind, which is where the children of Israel tried to, to leave in the so-called Exodus. Wow. So it's a very interesting thing. Yes, sir, you got more? Well, <laughs> yes, if they can't see it. Well, um, the desert, he goes out wandering. That's right. He's lost. That's right. And they, they never, he, he never finds himself again. The richest, most powerful kingdom ever known to man, what Solomon had, had all the riches. He was the richest man mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And now he's out in the desert. Right. And everything he Want, had goes to someone. Lost. That's right. Lost. Okay. Right. And, and so what does it mean? It means that even if, even, if you gain into your even if you gain into your meditation all of these things, They'll go right out the back door if you don't hold on to it. You've got to keep the temple active. Okay. Well, thank you very much.